our session this afternoon on action planning as part of our journey to net zero carbon emissions series of webinars. Everyone's very welcome. Um, we have introductions in the chat. You can keep uh, adding in there. Um, while I'm sharing my screen, I'm sure you've got used to this by now, but if you've not done a presentation on Zoom, then if you hover your cursor up to the top for view options, choose side by side view, it means you get better view of the slides without the little images of the people getting in your way. Uh, just to let you know, we are recording this session and um, the best one we're going to save and uh, upload somewhere so people can access it if they can't join us live. Um, but that means we're going to mute you during the presentation, which I haven't done, but if Catherine can do that, that'd be great. So if you have questions as we're going along, please do write them in the chat. Uh, if Catherine can answer them as we're going along, she will, and anything that um, is left or that needs a bigger discussion, we can come back to those at the end. When we get to the discussion at the end, we'll stop the recording so that you don't need to worry about what you say or your voice being on something that's preserved forever. We won't record that part of the session. And then um, afterwards, we'll send all the slides out to everyone. So you, you can make notes, but you don't need to anxiously scribble everything down. So when I was thinking and planning about this session, I felt there was rather a lot of bits uh, that we needed to sort of get a handle on. It was a bit like we've got this, a massive box of Lego with all sorts of bricks in and we don't really know what's there. So we need to go from, from here to this. And I can't promise that we'll have a perfectly constructed Lego wall by the end of today, but I hope you'll have been able to sort out some of your pieces and start to have a picture of how you're going to build and which pieces are going to go where. Uh, so I thought I'd start by thinking about getting all of our pieces in order. First of all, why are we on this journey to net zero in the first place? Uh, then how do we go about turning the challenge, the motion that General Synod set us into action? I'm going to have a little bit of a look at some of the processes that Oxford Diocese have started with because um, they've already begun this journey and they've got some insights to share. And then some of the work that you can do to lay out the groundwork um, for your planning and for the um, actions that you'll need to take. And then we'll have some time for questions at the end. So. How did the Church of England find itself on a journey to net zero? So the whole 10 year thing, so net zero by 2030, really comes from this report. It's from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and they published a report in October 2018. And this report highlighted what they predicted the difference in the world would be between global temperatures rising by one and a half degrees C or by rising two degrees C and the impact in the difference of this temperature rise on people and planet, uh, they predicted would be absolutely devastating, um, even just that half a degree. They also said in this report that we need to see significant reductions in our climate emissions in the next 12 years in order not to exceed 1.5 degrees C. So they were looking at reaching net zero by 2050, but the significant piece of work that needed to be done to make sure we got there had to be done in what they then said was the next 12 years. So if you think that was written in 2011, that takes us to 2030. So that's why we've got that as a target. And this report was um, quite incredible, really. It's a uh, it's a massive consensus of scientists all coming together and agreeing that this is what they needed to say and they needed to put this timeline on it. But it wasn't just scientists, although they are the ones who did the work, in order for this report to be published, it had to be ratified by the countries that it represented. So to have this kind of consensus from the nations themselves to agree for this to be ratified and to be put out there is quite something. So this is a landmark report and we need to take it seriously. So then we get to General Synod um, and um, we need to recognise that as a church we are part of this world that God has created, that we are part of the contribution to the problem but that we also need to be and can be part of the solution. So we need to take our responsibility and play our part in this fundamental change as we bring our emissions down to net zero. So we have to play our part and belong in the society in which we minister and, and which we have our mission. 
So the Synod recognised that we are facing a global emergency and that that's a crisis for God's creation, but also recognised that it's a fundamental injustice because the people who are suffering the most from the impacts of climate change that we're already feeling are the people who live in some of the poorest countries in the world. They're the most marginalised people. And they're also the people who've contributed the least to climate change. They have put the least emissions into the atmosphere and yet they're facing the consequences first and worst and with the least resources to deal with them. So across the board, it's just an issue of justice and that's why the church can and should and needs to be involved. So, General Synod was all parts of the Church of England, and that's parishes, bishop mission orders, education institutions, dioceses, cathedrals, the national church institutions, all of us, to work to achieve year-on-year -year reductions in emissions and urgently examine what would be required to reach net zero emissions by 2030 in order that a plan of action can be drawn up to achieve that target. Synod also requests report from the Environment Working Group and the National Church Institutions in the years, so the first one to be in 2022, and also calls on each diocesan synod and each cathedral chapter to address progress towards net emissions every three years. So we all need to report back on what we're doing as well. So we've been given this mandate by General Synod, uh, and if you were part of the process, you'll know that the original plan was for a 2045 deadline, but even that would have entailed really significant reductions in emissions in that first 10 years. So this target of reaching net zero by 2030 sets out an ambitious and prophetic target that we need to work towards. And it's not something that's sort of on the side or peripheral to what we do. We can see here in the five marks of mission that we one of our marks of mission is to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and to sustain and renew the life of the earth. Not just in the fifth mark of mission, actually work to take care of the environment, to tackle climate change, weaves through all the marks of mission. If we're to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, then that good news must be that God is reconciling all things to himself. That's all parts of his creation. If we're nurturing new believers, then we, that must include helping them to recognise the gift of God's creation, nurturing them in their awe and their wonder. When we respond to human need, that must include responding to and improving the environment in which people live. And thinking of the unjust structures that we are called to transform, then the climate crisis is one of those unjust structures which we are called to make a difference for. And this picture that keeps coming through um, in our adverts and on my slides, is something that we did when the last diocesan and environmental officers conference we met together a piece of artwork that tried to express how care for the environment weaves through all the five marks of mission so i hope that um helps you to see why we're here that it's part of our mission that it's an urgent call to action and we need to take um, take our responsibility and get involved. So how do we go from the motion, the challenge that was laid down at Synod to turning it into action? We need to take ownership of this motion and this commitment has to come back to, um, in your context and in your context to make a commitment to reduce emissions and to work out your plan of action. So that means taking ownership. So whether you're here representing a diocese or you're here on representing a parish or from a school, then you need to take ownership of this yourselves and, uh, and commit to it and then work out how you're going to get there. And one of the ways you might do that um, is passing a motion at Austin Synod or if you're representing a parish, maybe something in your PCC, something like that. Then you need to establish a team to take this forward. You're not going to be able to do it on your own. It's going to be lots of people that you need to work with. And one of the um, seminars in this series is about building your team so I'm not going to take too say too much more about that there will be more if you've missed it we will be doing them again so you can join another time and then setting out your plan which is really the focus of what we're talking about today but part of this plan needs to be your reporting back and your accountability structures who are you going to report back to who who are you going to be accountable to how do you embed that in your plan as you go along and then, so what follows is some of the work that's been done by Oxford Diocese to sort of start us off on this journey. 
So they started off, um, you can see this list from Oxford Dices. I've nicked it wholesale and it's their logo in the corner now. This, the process that they took started like this. They first of all set out to define the parameters by working out what the scope is, what scope of what is included in a net zero target. So they knew what they were dealing with. Then to assess the scale of the action needed. So that's about measuring, looking where we stand with each element. So the churches, the schools, the clergy housing, what are the core issues that they needed to address? Then looking at the resources that they had available to them and how they would set out the plan to address the, these, each of these issues in turn and then uh, within those resource constraints. And then on that basis, working out what a feasible timescale would be. So thinking about this timescale, we have got 10 years, which is both longer and shorter than you think. And if you have a look at this diagram, you can this is a suggested curve of how we're going to reach our net zero emissions. So to start with, we want to focus on the things that um, have the biggest impact, that take us the longest way in the shortest time. And then as we get to the end, it'll be the more difficult, more complicated issues that we need to grapple with. So you don't have to do it all at once and you don't have to do the difficult things first. You can do the easy wins first because they will make the biggest difference. But I also want to say that it's fine to believe and to understand that we're in the scoping, the measuring, the planning and the gathering phase. This is the time when we need to bring everybody on the journey with us as well. So we need to get it right. We can take our time measuring and understanding our baselines and working out what we've got to do because we need to understand and make a good plan. And this is a time when we can also share with other people why we're doing this, what's so important about it. This is a time to win people over and bring them on the journey with us. So this, this foundational stage is really important and it's fine to take your time over it and make sure we get it right. When Oxford looked at what they were planning to do, they really had a vision that the first few years, not just months, but years would be all about the managing, the experimentation, the gathering resources, and really significantly about the behaviour change. And it wouldn't be till later on in their planning that they start doing the spending on capital investment. So there's a lot of work to be done in laying out the ground rules before we start panicking about the fact that we haven't got any money. Okay, and then this I thought was really interesting as well. Um, Catherine shares this in her session. What's, it's important to understand what's in your control, what are you, so depending where you're coming from will be different things in this circle, but for, if you're coming from a diocese, it'll be your diocesan office, your clergy housing, the school fabric, the staff travel, these are the things that you'll have a direct responsibility for, so you can um, affect them and make things happen. But the things that are not directly under your control, but are under your influence, are things like church and school energy use. And then the other thing that we want to make a difference to is parishioners travel, for example, how are they getting to church? What about clergy family lifestyles? So you can say things and encourage and prod and promote, promote, but you can't force people in that final sphere to make a difference. And so when you're planning, it's important to know what you can change and what you can only influence. But also that's why I wanted to say that it's about the behavior change. It's about telling the story. It's about bringing people with you. Because if we want to have any influence in the things that are only under our sphere of concern, we need to make sure everyone is traveling on this journey with us. Otherwise, we'll only be able to tackle the things in this smaller blue circle in the middle. OK, so some insights in from Oxford Diocese's process. So, as I said, they defined their scope, the scale of the action, the, the uh, resources, and making a plan, and then what the time scale would be. So, when it comes to defining a scope, this is where we're up to so far, um, thinking about what's in and what's out. And if you're signed up to Catherine's webinar on defining and measuring net zero, she's going to go through this in detail. Um, but what I wanted to, why I wanted to show this to you today. Um, even so, it's because I want you to understand that we are talking about the energy use in all of our buildings. So that's our churches, our cathedrals, the schools that are under our um, control, clergy housing and bishops housing, church offices, peculiars if you've got those in your diocese and any other diocesan property and the theological ed educational institu institutions, I can say it, and then also the 
travel that we use for on work business. Um, so not um, parishioners travel, but staff and clergy travel. So those are the things that are in our scope. So there's, that's why I felt we needed to think about all the Lego pieces at the beginning. And then assessing the scale. This is all about the measuring um, and setting the baselines. And again, this will be gone into in detail in the Defining and Measuring Net Zero webinar. Uh, she'll go through the tools for measuring each part. And some of those are already in progress. So the energy footprint tool for churches. There's ways that you can look at school energy through the display energy certificate and ways that you look, can look at clergy housing through the energy performance certificate. And then the research and stats team are hoping to bring some of these tools together so that we can have them all in one place. So there are things out there to help you measure. Uh, you're not starting from scratch or working it all out on your own. When the baselines have been gathered, then you'll need to bring the data together so you know where to focus, so you'll have the most impact. Uh, when Oxford brought their findings together, they found a huge amount of energy being used by schools because they're heated and lit all, all during the week. And likewise, the energy use in large churches that were open all week was massive compared to those churches that are only open once a week. And it's kind of obvious, but it's worth seeing it on paper can help you um, really see the impact. And they also found that clergy housing was a significant um, factor. And then just something else to sort of throw into the mix that when they looked at their measurements, they could see um, their baselines, which would help them to know where they're starting from and would help them with their progress report. So they knew how much change had been made. But those baselines weren't necessarily enough to know how to plan what to do about it. So you could see how much energy was being used, but it didn't necessarily give them the detail of what they needed to change to cut the energy. So there may be more um, questions that you need to ask about how we make a difference to the energy use in this particular building or this church or this home. So then they got onto formulating a building, a formulating this to our buildings the basic principles are reducing your energy use so cutting waste so you're only using what you need not having the lights on and the heating on where you don't need it and then improving efficient energy efficiency in your building making sure the system is working and well maintained and then the energy that we'll still be using because we're not going to uh, switch all the lights off and the heating off we still going to be using energy so to make sure that we can decarbonize that energy as much as possible so switching to renewable electricity tariff and where we can moving away from fossil fuels so moving away from oil and gas and something that they found in Oxford okay right sorry yeah so once they'd started with these principles yeah, it's where do you start? And the one thing they felt in Oxford was to start with their off-grid properties when you're making your plan, where are you going to start? So it was those churches that were heated with oil systems that they knew they would have to change. They, uh, um, they were, aren't going to be able to continue like that. And so that's where they started. But the properties that were on the grid felt they felt they needed to wait to make a decision about those because the government themselves has also made a commitment to reach net zero carbon emissions. And in order to do that, there's gonna to have to be a national policy about how we decarbonize all of our heating in all of our homes and all of our offices. At the moment, that strategy is not yet clear, but there are three options in consideration. So one is hydrogen in the grid. So that would mean if you've got the right boiler, you can continue to use the same system, but instead of burning gas, you're using hydrogen. Another option would be district heating networks. Uh, so um, energy is supplied to a group of homes or buildings or um, businesses, or for switching to heat pumps, which we've done in a, in an in, on an individual basis in the building. So you can see the cost implications of these are quite significant. If we were gonna have to put heat pumps in all of our buildings, that's much more, um, expensive than just making sure we've got the right boiler. So the decision was made um, not, to, not to change heating systems straight away until there was a, a better idea about what's going to be happening at a national level. So if you need a new heating system then you're going to have to do it but if you can hold on and make a decision further down the line then that's probably wise. This will slightly depend whether you're a diocese with lots of off-grid properties or not if you're um, a tight-knit urban community, uh, then that's probably less relevant to you. 
So then they started to make their plan. What was their strategy for churches? Their initial measuring identified street, three strands uh, with three different approaches. So they looked at churches with high energy use, complex buildings, um, or where, where planned works were already going in. They looked at those with less complex issues, and then those where they weren't going to need to change the heating system or where energy use was so low that the capital expenditure to reduce emissions wasn't needed. So they were going to approach those in three different ways. Um, and Catherine has been doing a lot of work doing audits on church buildings and this correlates, so this approach that they found in Oxford correlates really well with the um, findings from these audits. And if you've signed up for the vision of a net zero carbon church, you'll see this laid out in, in, in much more detail about the three approaches uh, for churches, what you would do for every church um, as a basic level for everyone and for some that will be enough, what we do for higher use buildings and then more complex. And it's just really, uh, really interesting to see the two bits of work done have come to the same conclusions. And here are those guidance. So the guidance notes that Catherine will go through in the net zero um, pathway to net zero workshop, you can find them here on this website and this is what they look like. So there you can see, where do we start? That's the kind of actions that you need to do for every church. And then there's also this um, document, which you can find as well, which is the um, all sorts of guidance and tips and hints for um, improving the energy efficiency of your church buildings. Thinking about clergy houses, what was their plan? Uh, again, they wanted to start with their off-grid properties, switching them to an alternative heat source um, as the technologies become clear. And then to plan for um, thinking about the repairs that, that you have a program of repairs that go through in your um, diocese probably happen all the time, but making sure those repairs uh, work sort of fitting in with your journey to net zero. And then if there was any funds allowed left over, then to take measures that were always gonna be useful, that are always gonna help you bring your emissions down and that don't depend on the decisions that you need to make about the heating system as those decisions come later. So those kinds of no regret options as they've described them there. And then the um, decisions about making bigger changes would come later on transitioning the houses to a lower carbon heat source. And a similar approach for schools, starting with the off-grid properties, understanding how the facilities are used so that they're managed better. And then again, the no regret options, um, the things that you know that you can do that will make a difference regardless of what happens further down the line. And then I've just stolen this wholesale uh, from the um, Oxford document that I've been using for this because there's options for um, funding for schools that aren't available for churches, such as the Salix funding and the Renewable Heat Initiative, those kinds of things. What else will you need to come into your plan? There's travel. Maybe now is the time to start a, pl a planned policy on flights in your diocese. How many should you take or not take? Will you offset them? Will you restrict them? Can you start to make decisions about where you hold your meetings so that they're always accessible by public transport? At the moment, no one's meeting anywhere. Maybe you can hold your meetings online in the future and won't need to. Sometimes you'll want to meet together, but are there decisions that you can take? This time we don't need to get together, we'll do it online. Can you encourage clergy or staff to buy an electric vehicle? There's now an electric vehicle salary sacrifice scheme um, available. It's one has been set up in Sheffield, um, so I can help you find out more about that. So you basically buy your electric vehicle pre-tax and then you save the tax and your employer saves the national insurance. We're also going to need to plan for cathedrals and very likely the kind of work that we need to do in some of our bigger and more complex churches will be the kinds of things that we'll need to do with cathedrals. We need to think about land um, and I have to say in our 10 year plan that's definitely coming further along <laughs> the line than it is at the moment thinking about whether we use our land making sure it's not adding to our emissions and can we use our land to offset and sequester some of our emissions. And then investments, does your church or your diocese have significant investments? Where are they being held? Okay, so in brief, those are the kinds of uh, areas that you're gonna need to set out your plan.
plans for, but how do we lay out the groundwork? We're thinking really about this kind of work that we need to do now. What do we need to set in motion before we start thinking about the capital investment? We're going to be doing the planning at this stage. So thinking about the management, it's that step of agreeing to commit to carbon reductions. It's not an easy job. It's not as simple as coming home from Synod and saying, right, everyone, we're going to get to net zero by 2030. To get everyone on board, to get them to agree, is going to take some time. And that needs to be laid out at the beginning. How are you going to get everyone on board with that part of your plan? And then allowing yourself some time to get your team together, finding the right people, setting out the terms of, um, terms of reference for your team. Yeah, there we go. Put that in another dot point. Setting out your terms of reference, your reporting and accountability structures. Uh, as I said, we'll cover that in more detail in the Forming Your Team webinar. Then there's the gathering, gathering the information so you know what you need to do, where you need to plan for. It's fine to take time to get this right. You can start with the tools that we know we already have, the energy footprint tool that's available um, through parish returns and the, the um, energy certificates information that we already have for some of our buildings. And then it's time to start to think about the developing ways to gather other information. So the kinds of travel expenses that we, um, sorry, the kinds of travel that we would expect to have in scope are the kinds of travel that you would put on claim expenses for. If it's work and you can claim expenses, then that's the kind of thing that falls in our scope. So somewhere along the line, somebody's counting this because they're paying your expenses. So how do you gather that information together? And then thinking about your church house energy costs, that's probably just a case of collecting your bills. And then what about the gaps? You found out what your baseline is, but what do you need to do to make a difference? Are there tools already out there that will help you fill the gaps? It does strike me that we've got a system in place for um, church buildings and clergy housing that over the course of this next 10 years that we've got to get to net zero, we're going to inspect every single one of those buildings twice uh, through our quinquennial inspections. So you can start um, thinking about how you're going to use your quinquennials as part of your planning. Or maybe you can use your um, Archdeacon's articles of inquiry to fill in some of those gaps. Right, if I've got this right, the next slide will go into this in more detail. Yeah, so we don't have to think, we don't have to do everything this year. Over the next 10 years, we'll visit every building twice. Maybe you can set in motion a, a plan so that the first time you go out to every building, you're going to assess what do we need to do for this building to bring it down to as low, to as near to net zero as we can. And then the second time you go around each building, it, how, have we do, how have we made progress? Have we got there? Have we done what we said we were going to do? You can review. You can set out a plan for your articles of inquiry. Again, not just this year, but ne what, next year. What are you going to have over the next 10 years? What questions might you want to ask? This year, you could start by asking churches, have you filled in the energy footprint tool? You know, something gentle to ease them in. And then later on, maybe you can challenge, are you using a, a, um, a renewable energy tariff? Have you signed up to Eco Church? Those are the kinds of things that you could put in your articles of inquiry. And then keep reviewing this plan. So we can, you can start out, um, but at the beginning, you don't really know what you don't know. It's always the way, isn't it? So you don't need to have your, all the detail of your planned works all at once you can come back to them and review and say, where have we got to, what have we achieved and celebrate those achievements. Make sure everyone knows the things that you've done because that will be really encouraging. And then set out the next goals. What went well, what didn't go so well? How do we learn? How do we implement them in the next phase? And then with at this time thinking about behavior change, which I think is really about how we tell the story about why we're doing this, why we're on this journey. How do we embed care for creation, tackling climate change, environmental issues, so that it is fundamental into our discipleship? And making that a part of our discipleship will be fundamental to our success in achieving this target. So how do we embed that story into who we are as a church, as a diocese, as a parish? All parts of the church need to be involved in this. And so therefore you need to articulate that in your plan Part of your plan is planning how to tell a story. Um, so this is 
the Diocese of London's um, plan, 2030 vision, uh, and you can see that they've um, identified right at the beginning that tackling the crisis is part of their plan. But they've also got here at the bottom left here, an articulation of why this is an issue of justice, um, supporting victims of extreme weathers, because they've got partners in Mozambique and Angola that they can tell their story. They've put the kind of behaviour change into their plan, encouraging every church to be an eco church, engaging with young people and schools. And then the lifestyle choices, the things that are not necessarily in our control, but things that are important in helping it to become embedded in who we are and into our DNA. So we're not going to measure the consumption of our parishioners in our net zero target, but actually talking about those things helps to move the story on, move the journey on. And then you've got here articulated right at the beginning of their plan, the principles and theology, embedding it into our discipleship as Christians. And then it's only then that you get to the sort of technical stuff about what we're going to do with the church and what we're going to do with our energy um, certificates and how we're going to where and if we're going to install solar and that kind of thing. Uh, and then they've got another whole section here about the culture and behaviour change and the advocacy stuff that they're going to do. So this is not the whole plan. I've just picked out a few pages that I thought helped to illustrate. So I've mentioned eco church and eco diocese, and in, as a way of telling the story and embedding what we do in our whole discipleship, I don't think there's a better tool out there. Um, it looks at worship and teaching. It looks at the way we use our buildings. It looks at the way we use our land. It looks at our whole lifestyle and it looks at our community and global engagement. And what I really like about Eco Church is this holistic approach. Because when we've set ourselves this target of reaching net zero by 2030, it is a very technical target in some ways, and it's very much bound up in our buildings, our, in our land. And it could be quite easy just to focus on all of that and forget the fact that this belongs to our whole, uh, it's part of our worship. It's part of our relationship with God and our relationship with his people. And so Eco Church helps to bring this holistic approach to everything that we do. Um, so you don't get lost in the technicalities, but remember that it's part of who we are. Uh, and I've included down here on this side, all the dioceses, the ones that have signed up have got a tick to be Eco Diocese and the ones that have got the bronze award are um, starred here with a bronze leaf. And I think there's some silvers either done, but not yet on the website or very close to being done. Joe, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Your voice has just gone quite quiet at my end. I'm wondering if your microphone has moved or it might just be my computer. Uh, is anyone else? Um, hang on a minute. Wait, wait. I'm just going to disappear for a minute. Tom? Oh, I didn't mean that to happen. Tom? I'm just checking that my children are not eating my internet. Sorry. Is that better? Uh, we can hear you. It's just that your volume dropped a little bit. Okay, I don't really know why that is. Nothing else has changed. Um, if I sit a bit closer, is that better? Go for it. Okay, right. Okay. So, uh, yes, Eco Church and Eco Diocese. So these are the Eco Dioceses down this side. Um, and the way the scheme works is that you can, um, you get a bronze award and then a silver award and a gold award. So when you're thinking about your planning for your um, diocese or your parish, you can set yourself goals. What percentage of churches do you want to reach the bronze award by 2022 and then 2024? And which ones, how many will have reached silver and how many will have reached gold? And when will your diocese hit gold? Who's going to win? Who's going to be the first diocese to get the gold award? And I've put the website here. So when you get the slides, you've got the link so you can find out more about it and sign up. Um, New signups are on hold for the moment um, because as we're all struggling with the lockdown, some of the staff at Eco Church are on furlough, but all the information's there and you can start, you can look at the survey, you can answer the questions and you can start the journey even if you can't quite sign up yet and then come the autumn, everyone will be able to sign up again. So think about 10 years, what are the resources that are available? What other resources are available to help you tell the story? And can you set some landmarks as you go along? 
these two websites um, are preaching resources to help you um, bring the environment into all of your preaching. So sustainable preaching has lots of resources, uh, sermons and ideas. And then greening the lectionary is similar. And the way this works is that, that there's a sermon for every lectionary reading. It's kind of a work in progress. So as we go along, things are put up there. So if you want to look three weeks ahead, you probably won't find something. But each week there's a sermon which uses the lectionary readings and brings in environmental themes. There's Creation Tide. Um, so coming up uh, from the 1st of September to the 4th of October. So 4th of October is the Saints Day of St. Francis of Assisi. And it covers that harvest period, which is, is um, I find it a really helpful time to think about our relationship with the environment. And then this year, uh, Climate Sunday is being launched in Creation Tide, encouraging churches to commit to holding a service for, clim for the climate one Sunday um, in the next year. And to, so you hold your Climate Sunday service and then you pledge to take action to tackle climate change. And this is all with a view to the next um, UN conference on climate change coming to Glasgow. Uh, it was going to be this year, but now it's in 2021. So with these churches um, taking a pledge of action and looking ahead to COP26 uh, so that we can demonstrate the force and strength of feeling that the churches hold and use that to hold our politicians to account. And then there's the Lambeth Conference in 2021. Um, environment and climate change is going to be on the agenda there and if all the primates are coming from all around the, the world to talk about the environment then surely we should be talking about it in our own context as well so that might be a useful hook for you to encourage people to have that conversation and to get it going and when you've got visitors in your diocese next year from various countries around the world they may be able to tell their own stories about how the climate's been affected in their country and in their communities and that just helps people to get a, a handle on the idea of what's happening, that it's not something distant that happens to other people, but that happens to our brothers and sisters in the church. And I've mentioned COP26 in Glasgow. So what event would you put on in your own diocese? When would you hold it? Would there be more than one? Perhaps you'll have a series. And again, not just this year. So those are the things that are happening in the next sort of 12 months, but how will you keep telling that story over the next 10 years? I think it's really important to share good news and success stories because that's so motivating for people to know, well, if such and such a church down the road has managed it, then I'm sure we can do that. And maybe even a little bit of healthy competition as well. This needs a bit of planning. Could you have planned space for environmental news in your regular communications that go out? Catherine and I have got a weekly um, element in the internal comms that goes to the, um, everyone who works in church house. Um, just to let them know and give them an opportunity to share the things that they're doing about the environment as well. Can you use your social media? Do you need a dedicated page or do you want to feed something in regularly to your Darson page or your parish's page? Could you do something every year? Maybe Creation Tide every year is the time when you'll um, encourage every church in your diocese or every school in your area to think about the environment or climate in their services or their assemblies. So I think harvest is a good time, but Advent is also a, a reflective time. We had Lent this year. Lent lends itself to thinking about um, our own relationship with the earth. And then I had a look about the agricultural year. So that doesn't always feel relevant to everybody. But when I clicked onto the website, there were so many prayers and resources that had environmental themes. I couldn't believe I'd not found it before. So even if you don't use the agricultural calendar in your own particular um, church or diocese then I'm sure you'll find some really useful prayers there and then there's other regular events that you could hold a carbon fast maybe or a pilgrimage that you do every year or a, encouraging a cycle or walk to church Sunday uh, and there's I'm sure there's loads of ideas once you start thinking that you can start to put into your plan over the next 10 years and then I think it's really worth thinking about finding your own storytellers can you identify net zero champions? Uh, it would be amazing and wonderful if you could have one in each parish or mission, mission partnership. But if that's a bit too much, maybe you can start with one in each deanery and then they can find their own champions. Maybe that just go where the energy is. Maybe there's one deanery that's really keen and that's where you start finding your um, net zero champion. They'll be the people 
to um they will tell a story back into their church or into their deanery and maybe encourage people to use the eco church program but they'll bring the stories back out again so that you can share them with the rest of your your um diocese oh this is happening in our church this is happening in our deanery and then you can share that so it's a two-way relationship and how do you plan to grow this network over the next 10 years where will you start how will it grow Maybe you'll grow it by identifying net zero champions in schools, or perhaps schools is a better place to start for you um, because they're already keen and champing at the bit. And then this is a tool, I didn't want to make any assumptions because I'd never heard of Gantt charts until about three years ago, uh, but this is a really helpful way of um, setting out your plan. So you put down the things that you need to achieve on the left-hand side, you block out the months or weeks or however you want to do it across the top, and then you set out what you're going to do when and how you're going to start it. So this is my very rough and ready little picture of a Gantt chart. But um, somebody has sent one in, to me and Catherine to have a look at to see what we think. And it's much better than mine. So I'm just going to find that for you now. Uh, we'll have to stop sharing and start sharing again. So here it is. This is amazing. All these arrows and um, all divided up into streams, what the environment team is going to do, what the policy team is going to do, the comms team the Dyson Advisory Committee, and then churches and parishes. And you can see they've got the, a set of, a period of time to define and plan and work out what they're going to do. And then some implementation and then a review and do the next set of planning. So, so mine was a very, very simple Gantt chart, but you can make them much more complex. And I think it's a really useful way to sort of lay out visually. And then I'll uh, just see if I can move along. Here we've got gates, so significant periods. Uh, where they're going to stop and review and work out where they're going to go along and so it helps you to lay it out and work out where your sort of pinch points are and where your review points are and where the significant events in your diocese are and you can lay them all out into your chart so you know where you're going and where you're headed. So uh, thank you very much to James who sent that to us. Right back to the presentation. Okay, and then at this point, thinking um, just a final word about offset. So thinking about our timeline uh, of 10 years, this is um, getting close to the end now. Obviously, our priority is to reduce our carbon emissions to as close to zero as we possibly can. And it's also a priority to make year on year reductions so that we achieve things every year that we're always making an improvement. But it is going to be the case uh, that there will be some emissions that we can't reduce. And that's why we always talk about a net zero target, because there will be some carbon emissions that we can't get rid of. And so we need to do something to account for those, those residual emissions that we can't reduce. And that's what we need offsets for. And those offsets kind of take two forms, either their actual carbon capture so carbon sequestration and the most um, obvious way to think about that is a tree which absorbs carbon from the atmosphere but there's other ways on improving the atmosphere such as um, improving the soil use, um, peat bogs, uh, rewilding of habitats, natural meadows, that kind of thing. And the other way is to um, pay for some kind of project that prevents other carbon being released into the atmosphere. And that kind of thing is usually solar panels. And often it's um, in developing countries. So for example, solar powered ovens so that communities are cooking their food with solar power and not using things like kerosene, which is not only harmful in terms of climate change, but it was also harmful um, for their local air pollution and their breathing in the fumes for that. So that's how offsets work. You either absorb carbon or you prevent other carbon from being released. So it, I think that now, or maybe in two or three years, when we started to work out what our baselines are, we start to think about what, what are the carbon emissions that we still have? How much is our carbon footprint? And to assess that and work out how much it would cost if we were going to offset it. So for example, if we were going to buy offsets through climate stewards. And then that money can be notionally returned to our own internal energy efficiency projects so that we know what the cost of our carbon is in terms of finances 
as well as in terms of the environment. Um, and so we then put that cost to one side to improve our own energy efficiency. And you could, you could do that individually as a parish and just say as a church, this is our footprint and we will put that money aside. Or you could bring that all together and do it as a diocese so that every church pulls into one central pot and then that central pot funds some of the in internal energy efficiency schemes that you're going to need. So everyone will contribute, but not everyone will see the direct benefits, but everyone will see the benefits in terms of our overall carbon footprint. So that's for um, the slightly shorter term, thinking about our offsets. And then by 2030, we will need to have a policy where we actually know how we've accounted for that carbon that we haven't reduced, and that will probably involve buying offsets, perhaps through climate stewards, and the schemes that we decide to use on our own land. And um, at this stage, we're still at the working out what we're going to do stage. What will our policy be? And that's something I'm working on. And the church commissioners who own a lot of land are doing quite a lot of work at the moment uh, um, to assess the carbon footprint and the potential for carbon sequestration in their land. So we're going to work closely with them and use their findings to help us thinking about our churchyards and our glebe land. Joe, should your yeah. screen be shared with us at the moment? Uh, oh, yes, it should. I don't think it came back up after the fabulous uh, Gantt chart. All right, hang on. Oh, I know, my screen is completely frozen. That's not very <laughs> In which case, just keep talking. We'd much rather have you going than there. Uh... Right. Okay, so I think the only thing I've sp spoken about is offsets, and then the, only the next thing is a slide that just says questions. Uh, so if I can, um, oh, that's really unhelpful. Right, my screen is frozen. I'm very sorry, everyone. But we're on to questions. 